uh, we will now have a joint discussion session with both of the speakers. So it's open to questions. I think see there's several questions that were asked throughout the presentation. So maybe I'll start going one by one. Uh, the first question is to Dr. Dantas. Uh, and this is from Priyanka Baloney. In addition to the preterm and term infants, was a corresponding study done on the gut microbiome composition of mothers to say if there's an influence of mother's microbiome on their child? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, in this particular study that we published, uh, we did not look at maternal samples, though we had access to them. We have subsequently uh, uh, sequenced the uh, samples uh, from all of the moms corresponding to these kids, uh, both uh, right at birth as well as a couple times, that I don't want to say six months and maybe a year later. Uh, and um, we've also uh, sequenced now uh, samples out to eight years of age from many of these kids. Um, and um, the it appears that there are contributors from the maternal microbiome, but the kids' microbiome, and especially resistance genes very early in life, appear to be distinct. So there are, you know, there are some connections to the maternal microbiome, uh, but at least that heavy enrichment we see very, very early in life, uh, uh, for instance, in the preterm cohort, uh, does not appear to be resistance genes from fecal samples in the moms. We really think if we look at the identity of those bugs, most of those bugs in the, the hospitalized infants are probably bugs that are circulating in the neonatal ICU, the type of things that contaminate surfaces um, and you know, just happen to be able to live also in the gut. So that's a story so far. Thank you. Uh, have the next question is for Dr. Lampy from Reba Paul. Uh, Dr. Lampy, have you looked at the oral microbiome and its connection with the gut microbiome and its impact on digestion and some of the dietary biomarkers you were looking at? No, we have not. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's a great question and certainly adds another dimension um, to the story, um, but haven't, been, haven't delved into that area at all. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Noah Rappaport, and it's actually closely related to both Noah's and my work on the relationship between the metabolome and the gut microbiome. And it's for Dr. Dantas. Has anyone looked at blood fecal microbial metabolites by measuring coupled metabolomics data in term versus preterm kids to study metabolic capacity loss in more detail? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'm not aware directly in, I mean, certainly we haven't done it in our cohort for this particular set of questions. We have uh, uh, started doing a little bit of sort of, you know, I would say very, very rudimentary proteomic and also cytokine profiling of uh, fecal samples to try to understand maybe host-derived uh, aspects that could correlate. Um, I should have mentioned, even though all of the work I showed you was on this antibiotic lens, the preterm infants also have a series of really interesting pathologies, uh, devastating pathologies like necrotizing enterocolitis. So we're also interested in diving into that core to understand whether much like the antibiotic manifestations, whether there are other changes in the microbiome that would be prognostic of, of outcome. And that's where I think we're beginning to see some host feature, but that's a long way of saying that no, <laughs> we don't have direct uh, uh, blood or fecal metabolites. Uh, I think that would be very cool to be able to look at, but something we haven't. Uh, as somewhat of a follow-up question to that, and you touched upon it briefly, but now that you've followed some of these children uh, for a few years, can you pinpoint or can you, it's, it's a complex study design since preterm birth has its own complications and long-term risk factors, but this repeated antibiotic exposure in the first few days of, or weeks of life, does it actually correspond to phenotype uh, years later in childhood? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'll give you the short answer first. And, and we just don't have the resolution because of all of the other variables you've mentioned to be able to say, okay, this phenotypic host consequence can be directly linked over to this perturbation uh, early in life. Uh, what we are able to do is still ask these questions of, are there still, is there still divergence later on on the microbiome side? Uh, um, you know, many, many years later, now not only related to antibiotics, but uh, we've also analyzed a pretty rich dietary histories of all of these kids. And so we've got, you know, high resolution information uh, 
about uh, you know formula versus uh, maternal breast milk versus donor breast milk. Uh, and uh, we are beginning to see very surprising trajectories, uh, uh, not only of the microbes, but uh, we've switched over, and there I didn't show here, but to, to do uh, genome re uh, resolved uh, assembly uh, to get strain level resolution of what's going on in the microbiome as it evolves. And we're beginning to see SNP signatures even many, many years later that happen to correlate, not just correlate, right? we don't know causation with specific uh, dietary bins of these particular kids very early in life, right? So those are kind of tantalizing for us to understand. Or maybe there was a selection for some sort of, uh, um, you know, nutrient utilization that got carried over. We will need to still check that. But in terms of actual host phenotypes, uh, I think, you know, at best we might get weak correlations, but we'd have to, for me to trust the data, we need to do something mechanistic to follow up on that. And I think our animal models get a little bit close to that. Um, but the difficulty is our animal models, I think are really good for looking at acute changes. They're not great, obviously, for, you know, there, there are no animal models that are necessarily gonna tell you what happens eight years later uh, in a human. So that was, we're, we're trying to connect the dots. I think to be able to do the phenotypes, uh, it's going to have to be quite associative initially uh, rather than mechanistic. Thank you for your answer. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Lampy, and it's from Jean-Philippe Gordine. Uh, Dr. Lampy, did you look at the change in the urinary, urinary microbiome along with the urinary li lignans? Um, we didn't in this study. We have used, uh, we have actually haven't used anything with the urinary microbiome um, from the standpoint of our interest mostly in what's happening um, in the gut and the impact on um, production of particular metabolites. But um, for, from the standpoint of being a healthy population and the, the kind of level of microbes in uh, the urinary tract and the bladder, it um, seems unlikely to be a major contributor to uh, urinary metabolites. When we measure, for example, the lignans in urine, we measure um, total lignans, so we're measuring both um, the conjugated forms as well as the aglycone unconjugated forms. So if there's any, uh, for example, hydrolysis of the glucuronides um, in the urine, then um, all of those would still be picked up as a response. But I don't know Thank if that you. helps to answer the question. Uh, I, and I had one follow-up question that came to my mind, and I think it's one that you might be asked a lot. Uh, <laughs> But with a lot of these phytochemical compounds being metabolized by the gut microbiota and potentially more bioactive compounds in some cases, or at least more bioavailable in some cases, is there a feasibility in kind of circumventing the gut microbiome and providing the metabolites themselves to individuals as either preventive compounds or the, uh, treatment compounds? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the first thing that, that comes to mind that you think, oh, why bother with all this conversion stuff? Let's just give them the compound. And I think, you know, for some things that may make sense, but um, I think we need to know more because a lot of it may be the impact of the interaction of the substrate with the microbiome that is having effects on um, colon response, either through, you know, receptor mediated signaling um, in the colon, whereas if you were to give those compounds up front, you'd have to, one, you'd have to make sure that they were enterically coated so they didn't pop out until you got to the colon because otherwise they'd be absorbed small intestine and really not have any impact lower down. So I think until we understand how are these compounds acting and you know is the effect, systemic effect, actually mediated through the compound being in circulation or through the interaction of that compound with the gut epithelium and all the, the pieces there, then um, we may be selling ourselves short by trying to just go directly to you know, a bioactive, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Bilal for Dr. Dantas. Do intestinal microbiota become resistant to dysbiosis induced by repeated antibiotic dosage with passage of time? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We don't know for sure. Um, we have evidence that you know repeated exposure uh, will enrich for antibiotic resistance genes, and it's something we've grappled with quite a bit, at least sort of philosophically, that we t 
tend to paint resistance as always being bad, right? It compromises antibiotic, uh, uh, you know, usage against pathogens. It could uh, exacerbate horizontal gene transfer issues. But on, on, on one hand, a, at least in the context of a commensal, if you could enrich for antibiotic resistance in a way that doesn't help donate the pathogens, that might actually not be a bad thing, right? Because now you're encoding another resilience factor in. Um, so uh, we think that there is certainly enrichment for those factors. Whether that makes you more resilient to dysbiosis, uh, I think theoretically it must, right? Uh, over a period of time, you know, to repeated challenges, if you tend to, tend to get you know microbiomes that don't shift as much, what we don't know is whether there is something inherent about particular people's microbiome states that makes them more malleable or more uh, um, sort of uh, um, rigid, right? And so, and there may be so many factors at play: the status of your immune system, uh, how your original microbiome and how the niches got set up. And so, we are conducting a series of longitudinal studies or analyzing them at least. Uh, especially when people jump into these pre-dramatic shifts. So, you know, the, the NICU with antibiotics is one case, uh, but we have a number of studies now getting towards their conclusion of uh, travel, right? So you take people from one country and then you see what happens when they go somewhere else and come back or, you know, high residential something while they're actually on vacation and then compare that to the local population. And then you can see whether just observationally particular microbiomes quickly and shift based on exposure to the local environment or other ones don't shift as much. And then do those correlate with, for instance, in high infectious disease burden uh, settings of uh, uh, kind of colonization with the local bugs, right? Uh, and I think that helps somewhat answer this question of through repeated insults, whether it's antibiotics or other bugs, um, will they change? Almost certainly they will. The question is whether that's a good or a bad thing and could you most importantly predict that a priori, right? And I think we're getting better at doing that, being able to say, okay, you give me your starting microbiome state, maybe actually even give me, now this is hard, but give me three or more status updates of your microbiome before you travel. So I can get kind of a trajectory of what your actual variation is, and from that give you a kind of resilience index. Um, and, uh, and we're far away from doing that very well, but we're beginning to get there. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sean Gibbons to Dr. Lampy. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether or not the human gut microbiota modulates energy harvest from diet and how this may interact with obesity? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and there've been a lot of studies done looking at um, fermentation capacity and therefore production of short chain fatty acids. And, you know, even just thinking particularly in the context of very high fiber diets that, um, some of the very old nutrition studies came up with estimates of how much of um, the diet was actually attributed or energy was attributed to um, the activity of the gut microbes. And it could be anywhere from 10 to 15% of calories were coming from contribution by microbes. But I think, you know, a lot of this also has to do with the signaling aspect of this. And although, you know, Yes, you can provide more energy. Um, the effects of the short chain fatty acids on a lot of the metabolic signaling pathways um, is probably more important in the context of how the microbiome is contributing to energy harvest um, in relation to across individuals than particularly the, the specific fiber microbe interaction per se. I mean, it, it really relates more to how, the, how this is impacting the host response to the various compounds. Um, and often it, it seems like you hypothesize that it should work out this way. And often what we're seeing in the context of some of these studies, at least you know, to the extent that you can conduct them in humans, that it's showing the opposite. So I think you know, going back and forth between the mice and the humans to try to, to work this out um, and to try to work it out in the context of very controlled studies in humans is, is a direction that we need to go. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Lauren Anderson for Dr. Dantas. Uh, to what extent is the microbiome diversity differences between preterm and term infants due to C-section? 
Yeah, excellent question, because there has been a lot of work on this. Uh, um, so I would say in our preterm cohort, at least due to, in, when we looked at those acute differences, uh, we did not observe any differences in the composition of the microbiome based on mode of delivery. Um, now, I think there are a couple reasons to, to expect that. I mean, again, hindsight, maybe explain that, is, um, again, just that the low diversity enrichment of those particular types of bugs, right? So I think when people have shown differences in, in mode of delivery and the microbiome, you're usually looking at kids who are very quickly then exposed to, you know, other features. They have sort of more normal trajectories. And so there you might make, it makes more sense that you might have vaginal microbes versus skin microbes that dominate. None of those things kind of, uh, I should say, any of those impacts are just wiped out by the fact that you've got this massive antibiotic selection pressure and a much more constrained environment. Um, so that's how at least we explain it. We see no differences there in the preterm cohort. Uh, in our term cohort, um, we, uh, we do see some influence. Uh, um, so this is again, now no longer comparing term to preterm, just looking within the term cohort. Um, the, uh, and that is an interesting cohort because I, I didn't mention it for the purposes of this, but that is a twin cohort as well. Um, so all of those kids, there's a co-twin. And so we have an environmental and a sort of genetic control uh, there. Uh, and um, we're, we're taking that into account as we, as we look at, especially, right, one twin got uh, a different diet, for instance, because one was breastfed for a period of time or uh, got an antibiotic. And how does that change um, the, the trajectory that was maybe imprinted from mode of delivery. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the short answer is no impact in our preterm cohort, in our preterm cohort, uh, and sort of a minimal, uh, statistically significant but low magnitude signature, just early in life in our term cohort. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lamb. The next question is from me. I was hoping I can sneak it in, but one of your results showed uh, variable changes in blood proteomics. Uh, in response to a low glycemic diet based on adiposity. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts what might be driving this interaction effect. Yeah, you know, we see that quite a bit, um, that individuals with a normal percent body fat are often responding very differently than um, those with, with a higher adiposity. I think part of it is where you're starting in relation to many of your metabolic processes, where you are in relation to kind of um, low-grade systemic inflammation. So how things shift um, can be quite different. And um, so it seemed like for some of the inflammation stories, for example, that the responses that we would see with the effective diet, we would see for example, in the context of those individuals with higher adiposity, where we wouldn't see an effect in the low, in the low adiposity individuals. But things like um, some of the signaling in relation to metabolism, the um, normal percent body fat individuals tended to be more um, responsive to, to the dietary effects uh, and you know, were able to shift and, and move. And we see that too also with some of the um, bioactives, some of the phytochemical bioactives, that we often see effects of these in individuals of um, normal percent body fat that in the context of um, obesity and um, overweight that often the response is blunted. So many of these I think sort of relate to, you know, what is your basal physiology and uh, milieu on which these compounds are acting. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, and we're close to approaching the end of our discussion. Dr. Dampas, I had one more question for you, and it involves your work that you presented at the very end of your presentation that you br briefly touched upon, is the, the engineering the probiotic to be actually able to degrade phenylalanine and as, so, as a potential treatment for phenylketonuria, for example. Uh, my question, I was curious, how stable with this approach is the functionality of that probiotic long term? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, I think I had like one little quick blurb in it that I didn't get to. So uh, we were able to, because we were, you know, a large part of that study was looking at colonization dynamics and stability of, of genotypes. We did sequence uh, uh, those particular engineered probiotics too. Uh, in that case, out to a couple weeks, and we did we we did not observe any mutations in the actual engineered components. Uh, 
uh, while we did observe random mutations come up to the genome uh, uh, at approximately the estimated frequency and the measured frequency of, you know, just the, the, at the regular mutation rate. So just based on that, it appears that at least in that animal model, they appear to be stable enough. Um, now, you know, that's, that's only one shot on goal, if you will, right? There are lots of other features to consider. Uh, and also, I think that the question will really become when, how do you balance between wanting to uh, um, have a longer lived probiotic so you don't have to force people to take this drug all the time versus then the longer it stays around before you give another dose, the greater the chance that things could devolve. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we did not observe any changes. We saw no promoter changes, no changes in the, the gene itself, even though there's no other selection for it uh, over the course uh, of those experiments in those mice. Uh, the only thing I'll say is in a lot of our experiments, we did observe that Nestle uh, has the capacity, much like has been shown by others in human trials, to transiently and somehow variably colonize the gut, sometimes even in bizarre places. Like you know, we were able to harvest Nissel out of certain parts of the small intestine, which you really shouldn't be seeing E. coli sitting around there, right? Uh, we don't know how much of that is the idiosyncrasies of these mouse experiments, but it just tells us that even if we don't necessarily see the, the you know, massive genetic changes uh, uh, that impact the actual gene that we're putting in, other changes in the genome might still cause this bug to behave differently than what we wanted to do. And so, that's one of the big reasons why uh, we're designing kill switches so that no matter what it does, we still have control over its sort of on off nature. Very interesting. Well, I think that's the end of our discussion. Thank you both for a really, really fascinating talks. Uh, we'll reconvene in three minutes for Nathan Price and his closing remarks. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you.